May uh, meeting of the Tennessee Board of Funeral Directors and Embalmers. And uh, Ms. Bohannon, if you would call the roll, please. Fred Berry. Present. Anthony Harris. Here. Tanya Skill Haynes. Present. Chris, Chris Lee. Here. Scotty Porsche. Charles Rahm. Here. Pam Stevens. Present. Mr. President, we have six, six of the seven members present. Next item on the agenda is to uh, review and adopt the agenda. Make a motion we accept as presented. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Harris, a second by Mr. Berry to adopt the agenda. All in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, any opposed? We have the minutes from the previous meeting. Give you a minute to look over those if you haven't had a chance. that they be accepted. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Berry, a second by Mr. Lee to approve the minutes from the previous meeting. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Next item on our agenda is the rulemaking hearing. Uh, Mr. Bryant uh, will lead us in that. Uh, reminding of board members, uh, if you do speak during the hearing, if you would uh, identify yourselves. And if there are those here in attendance that want to speak at the rule making, uh, if you would please come and sign just with rule making hearing is called to order. My name is Troy Bryant. I serve as a staff attorney in the Department of Commerce and Insurance Division of Regulatory Boards. Will the agency representatives who are present introduce themselves for the record? Chris Lee. Brett Berry. Charles Rahm. Anthony Harris. Tanya Haynes. Tuesday, May 10th, 2022. This rulemaking hearing is taking place pursuant to Tennessee Code Annotated Section 4-5-204 in Conference Room 1B of the Davy Crockett Tower, 500 James Robertson Parkway, Nashville, Tennessee, and is available by electronic means via Microsoft Teams, which can, which can be located on the Commission's website, www.tn.gov backslash commerce backslash regboards backslash funeral backslash public dash meeting dash information dot html. On this page, the link for access to this rulemaking hearing via Microsoft Teams can be found in the chart located in the middle of the web page, in the fifth row with the date 5-10-2022, in the location column under the words Nashville TN, labeled Connect. The purpose of this rulemaking hearing is to solicit comments on proposed rules of the Tennessee Department of Commerce and Insurance Regulatory Boards Division, Tennessee Board of Funeral Directors and Embalmers have made public. The proposed rules amend required apprenticeship hours from 40 to 32 hours per week and to amend professional standards of conduct regarding interactions with the public, along with the requirement for a funeral establishment to release human remains when a second establishment is preferred by the family and release is requested. A rule is defined as an agency statement of general applicability that implements or prescribes law or policy or describes the procedures or practice requirements of the agency. Proposed rules are filed with the Office of the Secretary of State, notice is given to the public for comment, and a rulemaking hearing is held. Upon conclusion of the hearing and adoption of the proposed rules, the rules are forwarded to the Attorney General's Office for review of legality. If approved, they are filed with the Secretary of State, which is responsible for publication, and the Government Operations Committee of the General Assembly. The rules must stay in the Secretary of State's office for 90 days, the end of which time will be the effective date. Those members of the public wishing to speak and appearing in person should place their name on the sign-in sheet to the left uh, with um, <clears throat> to the left of the podium. Excuse me. Those members of the public wishing to speak appearing via Microsoft Teams should put their name in the chat box. Oral comments will only be accepted by those who have written their name on the sign-in sheet and typed their names in the chat box will be permitted to speak. Is there anyone that desires to offer oral comments but who have not written their names on the sign-in sheet or typed their name in the chat box? Seeing that there are none for those attending this hearing in person, I would call your attention to the table located directly behind me. 
On this table, you will find redline copies of the rule amendments addressed in today's rulemaking hearing. For those attending on Microsoft Teams, you will find a link in the chat box to the redline copies of the rule amendments for today's rulemaking hearing. The notice of rulemaking hearing included the entire text of the pr proposed rules and was published on the Tennessee Administrative Register website on March 11, 2022. Mr. Gribble, what additional notice was given to the affected individuals or groups? On March 14, On March 14, 2022, a notify was sent of the regarding the notice of public rulemaking hearing to those individuals who had signed up in advance to the department, indicating that they wished to receive communications regarding board matters. On March 15, 2022, the rules, a notice in the rules was placed on their website of the Tennessee Board of Funeral Directors and Embalmers. On March 15, 2022, an email was sent to the Tennessee Funeral Directors Association, Tennessee State Funeral Director and Morticians Association, and to the Cemetery Association of Tennessee. They gave them information regarding the rulemaking and the date that the rulemaking would occur. Also, um, I was in attendance at the Greater Knoxville Funeral Association meeting on April the 18th and mentioned the rulemaking hearing and information related to it at that time. And as I've come in contact with other individuals that I thought might be interested in, I've mentioned that to them as well. Of course, those I don't have uh, it specifically, but uh, we've given notice as much as po possible so that those that are interested would have the opportunity to comment on the rules. The agency public comment on the proposed rules, I, as moderator, reserve the right to limit such comments if they become repetitive. Please limit your comments accordingly. I will read the substance of the proposed rules into the record. First is 10 Comp R and Regs 0660-05-.01 for application. This amends the weekly hour requirement for both funeral director and embalming apprentices from 40 hours per week to 32 hours per week. Additionally, the second that is affected is 10 Comp R and Regs 0660-11-.05 for professional conduct. This amends the standard for how members of the public are to be engaged with by all persons related to the profession of funeral directing or embalming and provide specific examples of actions that fall below the standard of professional conduct. Additionally, the prospective rule requires a funeral establishment to release human remains to a second funeral establishment when requested by the family, the person with the right of disposition. Lastly, the rules require that interaction with the public must be in regard to the sensibilities of the public. Before I take public comments, I will read comments that I have received via email prior to this hearing. To date, I have not received any public comments via email pertaining to the rules for discussion at today's rulemaking hearing. Mr. Gribble, were any written comments received regarding these rules? No written comments were received regarding these rules. Are there any public comments from those present at today's meeting, either in person or via Microsoft Teams? Thank you. I'm Steve Spann with Gupton College here in town, and uh, I bring come before you just to speak on this just very briefly. But when I was encouraged to come and uh, give some comments regarding these two, I didn't realize that on the very front page it had my name where it says reasonable instead of respectful. But anyway, uh, now I know why they asked me to speak. But I do appreciate that, and I agree with, with that uh rulemaking 100 percent the the main reason i wanted to speak on was the changing the 32 versus the 40 from the from a student standpoint or apprentice standpoint and i also work work at a funeral home from a funeral home standpoint that that, that would be make it much easier for everyone as as you have a lot of funeral homes that have small uh, number of calls and and small amount of help <laughs> and as you know some weeks we work 80 hours and some weeks we work 30 <laughs> So uh, that would make it much easier to meet this rules and regulations of being able to 
to hit the 30, 32 hours versus the 40 hours, and I think that's a good change. I appreciate that. That's my comment, sir. Members of the board, do you have any comment related to um, his comment? Okay. Steve Murphy with, I work with Music City Mortuary. I just wanted to echo what Mr. Spann had said that um, but reducing the 40 hours down to 32 hours and various locations will be a benefit and allow them to complete uh, hard hours. Members of the board have any comments related to that? Are there any additional comments? anyone in person or anyone on a Microsoft Teams. Lastly, there are several measures I will need to adopt by motion and roll call vote as required by Tennessee Code Annotated Section 4-5-222. First, I will need a motion to adopt the hearing rules language as amended. First in 10 Comp R and Regs 0660-05-.01. So move. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Barry. Fred Barry. Yes. Anthony Harris. Yes. Tanya Scale Haynes. Yes. Chris Lee. Yes. Charles Rom. Yes. Pam Stevens. Yes. Mr. President passes. I will need a motion to adopt the hearing rules language amended and 10 comp R in regs. 0660-110-0.05. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Brent Berry? Yes. Anthony Harris? Yes. Tiny Scale Hayes? Yes. Chris Lee? Yes. Charles Rahm? Yes. Pam Stevens? Yes. Next, I will read the regulatory flexibility addendum. Pursuant to TCA 4-5-401 through 4-5-404, prior to initiating the rulemaking process, all agencies shall conduct a review of whether a proposed rule affects small businesses. The probable effect on impacted small business is likely a decrease in hours worked by apprentice funeral directors and apprentice embalmers. Further, the prospective rule will require funeral establishments to release human remains to a second funeral home chosen by the family when requested. The first funeral home, by law, may con collect any fees incurred from the second funeral home establishment, which recovers those costs from the consumer. There are not known less burdensome, less intrusive, or less costly alternative methods to achieving the purpose of these rules. These rules do not create additional requirements for any licensee and affect only behavior. The substantive changes are regarding professional conduct and as such does not create costs for compliance. For the rules to be less burdensome and intrusive would reduce protection afforded to consumers, which is the objective of the changes related to professional conduct. Additionally, the weekly apprenticeship hours amendment is due solely to statutory change and cannot be attained via less restrictive means. I will now need a motion to adopt the regulatory flexibility addendum for rule 0660-05-0. Zero one. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Barry, a second by Mr. Lee. Miss Bohannon. Fred Barry. Yes. Anthony Harris. Yes. Tanya Scale Haynes. Yes. Chris Lee. Yes. Charles Rom. Yes. Pam Stevens. Yes. Mr. President passes. We will now need a motion to adopt the regulatory flexibility addendum for Rule 0660-110-0.05. So move. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Harris, a second by Mr. Berry, Ms. Bohannon. Fred Berry. Yes. Anthony Harris. Yes. Tiny Scale Haynes. Yes. Chris Lee. Yes. Charles Rahm. Yes. Pam Stevens. Yes. Mr. President passes. I will now read the impact on local government statement pursuant to TCA section 4-5-228. There is no foreseen impact on any local governments. I will now need a motion to adopt the impact on local government statement. So move. Second. I 
A motion by Mr. Harris, a second by Mr. Berry. Ms. Bohannon? Ray Berry? Yes. Anthony Harris? Yes. Tiny Scale Haynes? Yes. Chris Lee? Yes. Charles Rahm? Yes. Pam Stevens? Yes. Mr. President, it passes. We use a copy of the additional information required by the Joint Government Operations Committee. All agencies upon filing a rule must also submit the following pursuant to TCA section 4-5-226, sec section I, subsection 1. Um, let's see. We'll now read the answers to the questions required by the Joint Government Operations Committee. All agencies upon filing a rule must also submit the following pursuant to TCA section 4-5-226, Section I, subsection 1. Section A, a brief summary of the rule and description of all relevant changes in previous regulations effectuated by such rule. The proposed rule amendments regarding the required weekly apprenticeship hours, along with amendments to professional standards of conduct. The apprenticeship hours are reduced from 40 to 32 hours pursuant to 2021 Public Chapter 549, Section 14. The standards of professional conduct are amended to prohibit unreasonable conduct towards the public and specifically identifies the prohibited conduct. Further, the prospective rules requires a funeral establishment to release the human remains to a second funeral establishment when requested by the family or the person with the right of disposition. Lastly, the rules require that interaction with the public must be in regard to the sensibilities of the public. Section B, citation to and brief description of any federal law or regulation or any state law or regulation mandating promulgation of such rule or establishing guidelines relevant thereto. Regarding the amendment of apprenticeship hours in 0660-05-.01, the 2021 Public Chapter 549 of the 112th General Assembly amended TCA Section 625312, Section B, Subsection 5, reducing the number of weekly apprenticeship hours of funeral directors and embalmers from 40 to 32 hours per week. As such, the Board is mandated to promulgate a rule in compliance with this reduction. The amendments of Rule 0660-11-.05 are not required in order to comply with current state or federal law. C. Identification of persons, organizations, corporations, or governmental entities most directly affected by this rule, and whether those persons, organizations, corporations, or governmental entities urge adoption or rejection of this rule. This rule would affect current and future licensees and applicants. It is expected that Tennessee Funeral Directors Association, or the TFDA, along with all licensees and apprentices will be proponents of the reduction of apprenticeship hours. It is expected that the TFDA will be a proponent of the amendments of the standards of conduct, along with current licensees. There, are, uh, there may be a small number of funeral establishments that are opponents to the new requirement to release human remains when a second funeral establishment is chosen over the current one in possession of the remains without having to pay outstanding obligations. However, that requirement is in line with industry standards and state law indicating the second funeral establishment is responsible for collection and remittance of that payment, not the customer. Section D, identification of any opinions of the Attorney General and reporter or any judicial ruling that directly relates to the rule of the necessity to promulgate the rule. There are no known opinions of the Attorney General and reporter or any judicial rulings that directly relate to this rule. E, an estimate of the probable increase or decrease in state and local government revenues and expenditures, if any, resulting from the promulgation of this rule, and assumptions and reasoning upon which the estimate is based. An agency shall not state that the fiscal impact is minimal, if the fiscal impact is more than 2% of the agency's annual budget, or $500,000, whichever is less. There is no foreseeable probable increase or decrease in state and local government revenues and expenditures re resulting from the promulgation of this rule. I will now need a motion to adopt the additional information for the Joint Government Operations Committee for Rule 0660-05-.01. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Berry, a second by Mr. Lee. Ms. Bohanna? Fred Berry? Yes. Anthony Harris? Yes. Tanya Skill Haynes? Yes. Chris Lee? Yes. Charles Rahm? Yes. Pam Stevens? Yes. Mr. President passes. We'll now need a motion to adopt the additional information for the Joint Government Operations Committee for Rule 0660-110-.05. So move. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Harris, a second by Mr. Lee. Ms. Bohannon? 
Fred Berry. Yes. Anthony Harris. Yes. Tanya Skill Haynes. Yes. Chris Lee. Yes. Charles Rom. Yes. Pam Stevens. Yes. Mr. President passes. That concludes this rulemaking hearing. Following this hearing, the rules will be held for additional comments and or rerouted if, substantive, if there are substantive changes. But if not, then it will be put on the rulemaking filing form SS-7039, submitted to the governor's office for final review, and then submitted to the attorney general's office for review and approval. Once the attorney general's signature is obtained, these are filed with the secretary of state and generally become effective 90 days from the date of filing after receiving a positive recommendation from the Joint Government Operations Committee. Thank you for being here today. That concludes. Back over. All right. President, before we get started on this, I need to recuse myself from the uh, legal report today. Mr. President, I too will need to recuse myself. Mr. President, I request just one very quick break just to uh, settle up with the uh, court reporter. All right. First complaint we have is complaint number 2021080451. Complainant, mother of the deceased, filed a complaint against respondent establishment, alleging that the respondent had provided services to the deceased at the behest of complainant's mother, who did not have legal custody of the deceased. Complainant contends that because her mother did not have legal custody of the deceased, respondent establishment should not have provided services for the deceased. Complainant did not provide a date of the alleged services. Respondent replied stating that after checking their records, they had no records to suggest that they had handled the services of the deceased. Complainant gave two names that the deceased may have gone by. However, respondent had neither name in their records for the alleged rendered services. The department attempted to send this case for investigation. However, after several months of attempts, our investigator was never able to successfully contact complainant. The investigator left numerous message messages on complainant's voicemail <clears throat> and provided a callback number. Based on the address provided in the complaint, complainant lives in Ohio, and the investigator had no avenues other than telephone to attempt to contact complainant. So based on the above, we would recommend closure for lack of sufficient evidence. no response from the complainant as of today is that right that's correct I, I know too i can vouch for um the investigator tried uh i would say went ab above and beyond what was expected and never got any response or any communication back thank you i make the motion we accept legal's recommendation for closure second i have a motion uh, Mr. Harris, a second but
Uh, this complaint is complaint number 2022-003061. Complainant, sister of the deceased, alleged unprofessional conduct on behalf of the respondent. Specifically, complainant alleged that respondent establishment had allowed a non-family member to make funeral arrangements for the deceased. Complainant alleged that when she called the respondent, stating she did not give them permission to start services, that the respondent hung up. Likewise, complainant alleged that once she informed respondent that she would like to have the services performed elsewhere, respondent became hostile towards complainant and demanded, as complainant contends, that complainant pay respondent $1,610. Respondent replied, stating that he received a call from a Helen regarding the deceased. Respondent stated that they confirmed with Helen that the deceased had no spouse or children. After the deceased was in respondent's custody, respondent received a call from complainant on January 23rd, 2022 who informed respondent that she had talked to Helen and asked to confirm that respondent had her sister. After discussing price, complainant stated she would look around for other prices. Respondent stated he soon received a call from complainant stating she had found another funeral home that would perform a direct cremation for less money. Respondent stated he was willing to release the deceased remains into the custody of any funeral home she requested. Complainant provided additional information to the complaint stating that respondent was requiring payment for services rendered before the body would be released. This case was sent for investigation. The investigator spoke first to complainant, who stated when she spoke to respondent, she questioned the stated charges and informed respondent that their prices were too high. After complainant had looked and found another funeral home to arrange the services, complainant, respondent, and an employee of the new funeral home had a three-way telephone conversation to arrange the details. When complainant contacted respondent at a later date to arrange the deceased release, complainant stated, um, she would not pay the $1,610 for the services rendered because she had not authorized the services to be rendered. Finally, complainant alleged that respondent was rude and unprofessional during their discussions and did not know where her sister's remains were. The investigator spoke, spoke next to Helen, who stated that she had known the deceased since she was a child. Helen stated that the deceased had had poor health conditions and that she had been the deceased caregiver and had looked after her for many years. Helen stated that she arrived at the deceased house after the Shelby County Sheriff's Department had arrived it was asked to identify the body since none of the deceased immediate family could be contacted. Helen stated she then contacted Shirley, the deceased aunt who lived out of state. Shirley spoke to the de deputy sheriff on the phone who informed her that she needed to contact a funeral home to have the remains removed. Helen stated that Shirley inquired if she knew a funeral home that would make the removal and Helen suggested respondent establishment. Helen stated that Shirley agreed to allow respondent establishment to make the removal and prepare the body. Lastly, Helen stated that she spoke to complainants several times who maintained she would come to Memphis to pick up the deceased possessions and make funeral arrangements, but to Helen's knowledge, complainant had never come to Memphis. Investigators spoke next to an employee of the funeral home who complainant requested the deceased be transported to. The employee stated that she received a call from complainant on January 28, 2022, inquiring about pricing and procedure needed to pick her sister up from another funeral home. After informing complainant of the procedure, the employee also informed complainant that it was their funeral po home's policy to require a letter from the original funeral home indicating that the charges had been paid or waived before they would make a removal from another funeral home. The employee stated that complainant said she did have charges at respondent funeral home and that she would work them out with the respondent. The employee stated that after speaking with complainant, she spoke to respondent who stated they were willing to release the deceased into the new funeral home's custody. The employee inquired as to whether a complainant had paid the outstanding fees, and a respondent stated that she had not. The employee stated that at no time did the respondent refuse to release the remains of the deceased, nor did he request that any fees be paid prior to releasing the remains. The employee stated that this continued across several conversations with the respondent, and that they were always willing to release the deceased into the new funeral home's care. The investigator spoke finally to the respondent who largely reiterated what was in their formal response, adding that they were professional and were never rude to complainant, that he informed complainant that he would be willing to release the deceased to whatever funeral home she requested, and that to their knowledge, the complainant had never come to Memphis to set up any arrangements for the deceased. The respondent further stated that they did still have the remains and made an application to have the deceased buried at the Memphis Shelby County Cemetery. Based on the above and the swarm affidavits of multiple sources, it appears based upon the swarm statements obtained during the investigation that although respondent would have liked to have been paid the $1,610 for services rendered, respondent did not hold any of the dis hold the body of the deceased in consideration of that payment being made. Therefore, we would recommend closure. I have a question. What is the 
$1,610 for. Is that a removal fee? That's correct. My understanding is that that includes the removal fee as well as embalming services. Did the family give embalming authorization? Sign documents saying that it was, they, they did want their loved one embalmed? My understanding is that is correct, that it was kind of a difficult situation and that the complainant, from what I recall, lived in East Tennessee, um, away from Memphis, and that kind of Helen's position is kind of the only person on the scene who then contacted a family member who was out of state were kind of in a difficult spot and that authorization for removal and embalming was given to the respondent establishment. Sorry to ask this question, but what is legal's opinion on that again? I'm sorry. To, for I'm, the for the family to pay it or not to pay it? I would say in relation to this complaint, um, where complainants, I guess, issue here was that they did not want to pay that and as a result filed a complaint against the respondent. Um, I suppose to perhaps not answer your question very directly, um, since the scope of the complaint is on respondent establishment, I suppose legal is less concerned about the payment of that and whether the respondent establishment was saying, if we don't get the payment, we're going to hold your family member. Um, based on what we received via statements from the respondent and the other funeral home, that appears to not be the case. Um, so I, I suppose the concern was more so from legal's perspective as to whether the body was being held, which it appears it was not. opinion since the respondent took the loss there I just recommend we take your legal advice for closure second I have a motion to accept recommendation by mr. Harris a second by miss Stevens all in favor aye. 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 any opposed next complaint is complaint number two zero two zero zero three zero zero one complaint and alleged that on January 22nd 2022 Respondent Funeral Director utilized an unlicensed apprentice to fill out the role of licensed funeral director. Complainant further alleged that unlicensed apprentice was named Stacy and that they were a licensed EMT but were not a licensed funeral director. Respondent replied stating that they had conducted only one service on January 22nd, 2022 and that they themselves had worked that service. Respondent included a worksheet of services that documented the services provided before and after January 22nd. Likewise, respondents stated that they have only one funeral apprentice and their name is not Stacy. The case was sent for investigation. The investigator spoke first to the complainant who stated she only became aware of the alleged issue after she heard about the matter from a deputy sheriff who escorted one of the funerals from respondent's funeral home. The complainant alleged that the officer asked a Stacy who was in charge and that Stacy allegedly replied that, quote, she guessed she was running the show, end quote. The complainant admitted that she was not physically present for any of the services conducted by respondent's funeral home and admitted that she had no proof of her complaint. The investigator spoke next to respondent who largely reiterated what they had stated in their formal response, adding that in the entire time they had been in business, they had never employed someone named Stacy. Based on the above and the admitted lack of proof on behalf of complainant, legal would recommend closure. I must be a little slow, but uh, who took down the information if it wasn't Stacy on the funeral and, and started the process? Um, on the, the service that was conducted on, my understanding is that from the respondent's statement that he 
was the one who from the establishment worked that um that service um he uh during the investigation uh the respondent had also provided a um kind of a essentially a schedule sheet of who had worked what and um there was no stacy on and she's at all So the real complaint is that the Stacy that's not there didn't handle the funeral properly. Is that what I'm hearing? No, the uh, the complaint is that um, Stacy uh, is a purportedly a, a Stacy that may or may not exist. It seems uh, is a licensed EMT, not a licensed funeral director. So the complaint is alleging that Stacy was operating as a funeral director as opposed to an EMT or whatever Stacey's responsibilities and duties may have been or involved. And it's it's further compounded by the fact that um, the complainant was not there themselves, that basically everything they heard was hearsay um, and that they themselves have no proof or evidence. And um, sometimes everybody thinks they're a funeral director. My, I would like to make a motion that we go with legal's recommendation. Motion by Ms. Stevens. Is there a second? Second. I have a second by Ms. Haynes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Next complaint is complaint number 2022-003681. Complainant, a co-worker of the respondent, submitted a complaint alleging unprofessional conduct on behalf of respondent. Specifically, complainant alleged that respondent was disrespectful in her language directed to the bodies of the deceased. Further, complainant alleged that the respondent created a toxic work environment by speaking lowly of other employees or by yelling at them. Finally, complainant alleged that respondent is negligent in their embalmings, does not properly set the features or embalm. Respondent replied, apologizing if any comments they had made could have been misconstrued and acknowledged that, quote, transparency and bluntness may be their fl fatal flaw. Respondent denied that they negligently performed their duties, stating that they take necessary steps in order to properly, properly treat and preserve each decedent that comes into their care. Above, the bulk of the complaint appears to be a workplace dispute and is beyond the jurisdiction and authority of this board. However, respondent did not deny or refute complainant's allegations of calling the decedent's disrespectful names. Therefore, Lee would recommend a letter of warning. So I understand the complainant is an employee of that location. That is correct. I'm reading this correctly and hearing you correctly. This sounds like to me a disgruntled employee. They could not get along. Um, this is just my opinion. The uh, respondent doesn't have a disciplinary history. Would there not be maybe a reason we wouldn't do closure here instead of a letter of warning since that is a internal dispute i i think if word would favor a, a uh, closure with that i suppose legal's reasoning on recommending a letter of warning is that well i do certainly agree that most of what is going on seems to be more kind of workplace dispute issues however kind of the i, I think they start to kind of tip into the realm of professional conduct with the allegation that the respondent would call the deceased you know, unflattering names or what have you. Um, again, kind of all legal had to go on is the responses and the respondent never denied doing that. I believe the respondent um, kind of addressed everything else but never denied calling um, decedents. That is something that we're um, was that closure would be? I agree with Mr. Harris, except for the fact that um, if this is a letter of warning, at least you've got some history with this uh, employee in case anything else comes before the board. That's correct. That being the case, I'll make a motion. We stick with your recommendation, letter of warning. I have a motion by Mr. Harris for a recommendation. Is there a second? 
Second. Second by Ms. Steve. Favor? Aye. Uh, Next complaint is complaint 22001. Complainant, mother of the deceased, alleged unprofessional conduct against respondent funeral director. Specifically, complainant contends that following the initial interaction setting up arrangements for removal, it was very difficult to get in touch with respondent. Complainant maintains that scheduling issues continued as respondent informed complainant that there may be a conflict with another service and that respondent may not be able to do the time agreed upon for funeral services. Complainant contends that when they next spoke to respondent, they inquired when the earliest they could arrive at the funeral home would be for a private family viewing. Complainant stated that respondent told them that they could come by at any time because the doors would be unlocked and that respondent's wife would be there. Complainant stated that their parents, the decedent's grandparents, drove four hours to discover that doors were locked and attempts to contact respondent were unsuccessful. On the day of the service, complainant alleges that respondent did not conduct the funeral as arranged and still could not be contacted. Instead, the wife of the respondent conducted the service. Complainant had numerous complaints regarding the provided services, including that the respondent's wife was rude, claimed she initially said the de- intentionally said the deceased's name wrong, and that agreed upon details were not done as requested. Finally, complainant alleged that the deceased was buried improperly and that she and her family had to pick rocks out of the grave and fill the grave themselves. The wife of respondent replied on respondent's behalf, stating first that they uh, informed complainant that the date of January 29, 2022, had been scheduled for another family, but maintained that complainant was adamant about that date. Respondent's wife and respondent stated that they are both licensed funeral directors, and in order to meet the needs of the family, respondent put the wife in charge of complainant's service. Finally, respondent's wife stated that at the gravesite, a young man from the family asked if he could use the shovel to place the first few shovels of soil. Respondent's wife stated that she obliged, but that the young man did not return the shovel, and that the family began digging through the soil looking for rocks and gravel. Respondent's wife stated that they continued, stating that they wanted a discount for their work. Respondent's wife added that she pronounced the deceased's name as written and apologized if she misspoke when pronouncing the deceased's name. This case was sent for investigation. The investigator spoke first with the complainant, who stated that, one, respondent was unresponsive to her calls from the beginning after the death of the deceased and throughout the week while making arrangements and bringing items for the deceased to wear. Two, the church was not opened at the time respondent stated it would be open on the day of the service opening at 1 p.m. when it was quoted to open at 8 a.m., thus causing the 1.30 p.m. funeral service to be delayed. Three, complainants specifically requested that respondent, not respondent's wife, conduct the services because of past negative dealings with the wife. Complainant asserted that respondent assured her he would conduct the services, but did not. Four, complainants stated that respondent's wife was extremely rude and unprofessional to her and the family. Five, complaints stated that details of the funeral, such as music and a bracelet to be placed on the daughter, were not used or implemented as agreed. And six, complaints stated that at the cemetery there was no ch- tent, chairs, or stand for the casket to be placed for the service, that the grave was covered with a blue tarp, and that the family had to remove rocks from the dirt pile and fill the grave themselves. The investigator spoke next to respondent, who stated that he received numerous calls from complaint and the paternal grandmother of the deceased regarding arrangements for the services. Respondent stated that when he met with complainant, she requested he conduct the funeral services. However, respondent claims that he informed complainant that he had two additional services that day and denied that he stated he would be the funeral director for their service. Finally, respondent stated that on the morning of January 29, 2022, he took the remains to the church, set everything up for the service, and had an employee wait for his wife and the family to arrive. Respondent then left to attend to the other two services he had that day. Finally, respondent added that on the following morning, he went to the cemetery to check on the grave and saw that the grave had been filled and enough room had been left at the top for the city to add soil to the grave later. Finally, the investigator spoke to respondent's wife, a licensed funeral director. The wife stated that she arrived at the church at, a church at approximately 11.30 a.m. on the day of the service. Further, the wife stated that while conducting business with the father of the deceased, complaint interrupted them on several occasions and was very upset. The wife maintained that at the cemetery, the dirt the dirt did have rocks and the family did not want the rocks in the grave, so the family removed the rocks from the dirt pile. The wife reiterated that a member of the family asked to place the first shovel of dirt on the grave, but would not return the shovel and begin filling the grave himself. The wife stated that she explained to the family that the cemetery was owned by the city, and that a maintenance worker would be by to tamp the grave and apply sod. 
The wife denied being rude, disrespectful, or unprofessional to the family and added that to date the father who had agreed to pay for the funeral services had only paid for half of the bill and informed the wife that he would not be paying for any additional money because so many things had gone wrong. Based on the above and documentation provided during the investigation, it appears that respondent failed to respond to communications of complainant, failed to have someone at the grave site to close the grave, and failed to have the church open at the promised time. Therefore, we would recommend a $250 civil penalty plus the cost of investigations, authorized via consent order and formal hearing if necessary. To make sure I'm reading something correct, had they set the time and then come back and said, no, that time's not going to work? Or am I maybe misunderstanding that? Admittedly, it was very much a he said, she said situation with a lot of the details. I, um, I think potentially what may have happened is that respondent was poised to do it. And then for whatever reason, scheduling conflicts arose and that may be details of point A didn't get to point B when the wife of respondent ended up handling some of the finer details of those services. Um, there were conflicting stories of what were agreed upon in details specifically. And if I read this right, the the husband of the director team went and set the service up, left the wife, stepped in and did the service? That is correct. So it sounds like they got into the church. Um, from, again, from kind of three different versions of the story almost, um, complainant said that they had asked, how early can we get there? And that the uh, maternal grandparents attempted to get there at 8 a.m. and it was logged. Um, I believe they said it was later in the afternoon, I believe around 1 o'clock when they got in. The wife of a respondent says that they arrived at 1130. Um, and then again, with the respondent saying that he had arrived that morning and had set things up. Um, so it, it kind of almost three different timelines and aren't entirely certain which of those may be the case. But, but it seems from um, the wife's admission that she got there at 1130 was that the, the time that complainant understood that the church would be opened, it was not. You hit on something. I had a note that it is a lot of he said, she said, she said. Um, and going back to a previous one, no disciplinary history here. I'd almost be intended with a letter of warning here, but I'll wait to hear from fellow board members their their thoughts. Surely there's some sort of documentation, information sheet or something that states when the funeral was supposed to be, I mean, notes of any kind, anything that was from the uh, respondent to say, this is what we told the family, or is it all verbal? My understanding, it is all verbal. I know when our investigator went out, typically, I would say 99 out of 100 times, and if I don't ask for it, the investigator is good enough to ask for it anyway, we get the file and comb through it and make sure that if details like that are there from my review of the file it appeared that kind of those finer details and things like that were verbal i didn't note anything in there that specifically had a um, family shows up at this time my understanding and this may be incorrect but complainant mentioned that um, she had had maybe not so positive interactions with the wife of respondent so i suppose reading between the lines the respondent complainant maybe knew each other like into where the documents weren't quite as formal where i agree that would make sense to have on those documentations um from my review of them i did not see any details that specified specific times i think this is my opinion that the um the fine should be um the civil penalty, and maybe a letter suggesting they learn how to write things down.
make a motion to um, go with the recommendation of what the legal has, um, the $250 civil penalty, plus the cost of investigation. I have a motion by Ms. Stevens to accept recommendation. I'll second. Second by Mr. Harris. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Any opposed? Next complaint is complaint number 2022004851. Complaint and alleged unprofessional conduct on behalf of respondent. Specifically, complaint and alleged that they had been trying to contact respondent and had had no response. Complaint and stated that they had contracted to have the body of the deceased sent to Mexico, but that they could not get in contact with the respondent. Respondent replied, stating that they received the first call from respondent on December 9, 2021, and wrote and emailed the funeral bill to complainant on December 21, 2021. Respondent contended that they received partial payment on December 28, 2021, and were told to hold the check for 10 days, but ultimately held it for two weeks. Respondent contends that they gradually received partial payments up and until January 20, 2022. Respondent denied that they had delayed or failed to communicate with complainant or their family, Respondent stated that the paperwork had been signed off by the Secretary of State and that the flight arrangements had been made. Legal spoke to complainant on April 22, 2022, and confirmed that the body had made it to Mexico. Complainant, however, reiterated that respondent would deny their phone calls and that he had been very difficult to get in touch with and were often given the runaround when trying to communicate with him. Based on the above, legal would recommend a letter of warning. curious was there a reason um, the first call received December 9th and then the uh, wrote and email didn't go out till the 21st it's almost two weeks is there a reason the delay there um, the respondent never provided a reason for them There seems to be a consistent disciplinary history here, and um, letters of warning are, are not helping at all, obviously. So, um, this is a very confusing uh, situation from the standpoint of a delay of, of billing, a delay of sending um and of course you have to delay the sending to mexico because of all the um, the uh, hoops that you have to jump through um not returning phone calls um, I, I really think that legal needs to look at a stronger um, disciplinary and that's my opinion Glad you brought that up because I was going to say the same thing with the history. I mean, we see there's been multiple fines. Is there maybe a recommendation from you as legal? I just don't think the letter of warning is our right path on this one. Is there maybe a, something you'd recommend stronger that we do here to get attention? I suppose to provide a little bit of context, my, rec or my recollection on this was, again, a little bit of you know, she re, uh, the complainant reiterated to me whenever I spoke to them over the phone that he was difficult to get in touch with. And in his response, he denied and said, I was available at all times. It's, it does get difficult on kind of a minor version of it. He said, she said of it's, we didn't receive any documentation to show a call log of, I've made 10 calls, never received anything back. Um, I would say for Legal's recommendation, if, if the board is interested in a more um, monetary penalty, letter of warning, and with the nature of the communications and the fact that respondent denied it, um, I would. It's ultimately within the board's discretion as to what the board feels appropriate, but. Um, in the file, complainant says, I called and didn't get a response. Respondent says, I always answered. And 
to parse. As you know, I'm new on the board. Um, somebody that's writing bad <coughs> checks and operating an establishment license without funeral director, um, GPL errors. Um, there's a history of possible non-communication and I I would recommend that this go back to legal I don't think $250 is a strong enough penalty no I, I agree with you <coughs> totally agree with you um, Definitely struggling with the letter of warning. Would want to make a recommendation for legal. Um, one thing, uh, and this is more of, I guess, to provide context, not to disagree or or anything of that. Nature. Disciplinary history is. Um, five years old from the most recent, starting in 2017, whereas that kind of slew of complaints ranged back to 2010 and 2011. Um, that I would also propose to the board that if this goes back to legal and we come back with a much stronger penalty and respondent, you know, if this ultimately goes to a hearing, we can essentially only get a hearing what we can prove. And if it testimony of I called him he didn't answer she called me I answered I suppose that's the it may not get to that point but if it did I wanted to provide that context just in case establishment This establishment under the same ownership as in the history of complaints. So history is history, and uh, if somebody has this kind of con conduct repeatedly, um, I don't think that that we as funeral directors have the right to have something expunged because it's that old. And that's, that's the art of funeral directing is to have proper um, conduct, professional conduct. Um, and I'm not aware of what the highest penalty could be, uh, but I do think 250 is too low. To step out and make a motion here that um, recommend for a seven hundred and fifty dollar penalty uh, with the right for a hearing if they so wish. I'll second. I have a motion by Mr. Second by Mr. Apt from the recommendation letter of warning to a seven hundred and fifty dollar fine uh, and authorize a consent order for a formal hearing if necessary. Favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Next complaint is complaint number 2022006091. Complainants under the deceased filed a complaint against respondent funeral director alleging unprofessional conduct. Specifically, complainant stated that he had met with the respondent on January 18th, 2022, where he paid for the deceased cremation and for extra copies of the death certificate. Since complainant lived out of state, complainant requested that respondent ship the ashes and death certificates to him at his home address. Complainant stated that respondent informed him that this would not be a problem and was quoted that he would receive them in, quote, no more than two weeks. Complainant stated that as of filing the complaint, February 17th, 2022, he had not received the ashes nor the death certificates. Complainant further reveres that when attempting to contact respondent, he is never able to speak to him directly and that the staff is rude to him. 
Respondent replied, stating that on January 17, 2022, the complainant had contracted with the respondent for delivery of the ashes of the deceased and death certificates. Respondent contends that he stated the delivery, quote, will take some time, four weeks or more. Respondent further stated that the death certificates were signed by the doctor and forwarded to respondent on January 18th. Then on February 9th, the third party crematory cremated the body. Respondent stated that on February 16th, the respondent mailed the remains, death certificate, and jewelry through USPS. Respondent further stated that during the four weeks following the contracting for the services on January 17th, complainant called respondent at least three times regarding the status of the process. Respondent contends that since there was no new information to provide complainant, respondent had no reason to contact complainant at that time. Respondent stated that on February 16th, Respondent contacted complainant to inform complainant that the death certificates, ashes, and jewelry were being mailed and to confirm the mailing address. Respondent denies that he was ever rude to complainant. On May 4, 2022, legal spoke with complainant in order to receive an update on the complaint. Complainant stated that they had eventually received the ashes and death certificates roughly a week and a half after speaking to an employee of the establishment for the final time. Complainant stated that it took roughly a month and a half in total to receive the ashes and certificates. Based on the above, we would recommend a $250 civil penalty authorized via consent order and formal hearing if necessary. The explanation of the length of time that it took to complete this? No, there was no Proof of a signed receipt on the cremated remains when shipped. Um, no, not that, not that legal received. What date were they received um, by the family? Um, when I spoke to the complainant, he didn't give me a specific day, but he said it was roughly about six weeks after um, he had contracted, which was January 18th. So it would appear that, according to respondent, um, they mailed the remains in um, death certificates and jewelry through the Postal Service on February 16th, basically right at a month since they had been contracted. According to complainant's timeline, for whatever reason, it was about two weeks before they received, if, I suppose if everyone is, if, if their recollection of events are correct, um, complainant received that two weeks after it was put into, um, into the mail to be sent to them. No chain of custody from the respondent to prove dates or anything? No, not that was provided to legal. Due to the lack of documentation that we have before us, I make a motion we take your recommendation $250 penalty. I have a motion to recommendation by Mr. Harris. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's complaint. It's complaint number 20220067711. Complainant, a former employee of Respondent Establishment, alleged mistreatment of human remains. Specifically, complainant alleged that Respondent failed to fix a failing cooler, causing the sedents to deteriorize. Complainant also alleged that Respondent engaged in body stacking on three separate occasions. Due to the severity of the allegations, legal did not send this complaint for response and immediately conducted an investigation. First, the investigator pulled the two most recent inspection reports for respondent conducted on July 13, 2020 and June 30, 2021, respectively. Neither of the reports noted any findings related to the allegation of complainant. 
The investigator next arrived at the respondent establishment unannounced and arrived first at the crematory. The investigator observed two three-body refrigeration units, one labeled out of service, and the other that contained three deceased human remains with the temperature gauge at 38 degrees. The investigator also noted a large refrigeration unit, which could house approximately 36 deceased bodies. Temperature gauge reflected a reading of 36 degrees. The investigator found 13 deceased remains in a large refrigeration unit. However, none of the bodies were stacked on each other, were either dressed or in some type of body bag. The investigator also noted that the cremation log appeared to be complete. The investigator then moved to the funeral home where he observed six deceased bodies, one in the chapel, one in the visitation room, and four in the preparation room. The investigator stated that all bodies were properly labeled with the required identification device. The investigator spoke with the department field representative regarding his past inspections, who stated that he had inspected respondent establishment numerous times and always visited the refrigeration units and never once saw any body stacking or bodies not properly covered. The investigator spoke next to a complainant who alleged that the refrigeration units were constantly breaking down and that on a few occasions she witnessed bodies being placed on the floor of the walk-in refrigeration unit and bodies not properly covered. Finally, complainant stated that she had brought to the regional manager's attention several individual instances with the deceased remains not being properly cared for, including body, body fluids and blood spills contained in the walk-in refrigeration unit. Complainant added that she had filed a complaint against respondent with TOSHA, Tennessee o Occupational Safety and Health Administration, as well. Two days later, the investigator returned to respondent establishment for a second surprise inspection. Again, the inspector did not see any bodies placed on the floor or bodies not properly covered, nor did he discover any body fluids or blood spills in the refrigeration unit as complainant had alleged. During the second visit, the three-body refrigeration unit contained three bodies and displayed a temperature of 37.9 degrees, and the walk-in unit contained 10 bodies and displayed 33 degrees. The investigator interviewed the manager of the respondent establishment, who stated that he had never witnessed any body stacking nor bodies failing to be properly covered. The manager stated that in the event the units were at capacity, the staff would place the deceased human remains in a cremation alternative container and place the alternative container on a casket dolly. The manager reiterated that bodies were never placed directly on the floor. The manager further stated that any time refrigeration units stopped functioning properly, they would call a company to make repairs. The manager added that since one unit was always having problems, they opted to put an out-of-order sign on it so that it would not be inadvertently used. The investigator spoke finally to the regional manager who also stated that he had never witnessed any body sacking and that if he had, he would immediately correct the situation and investigate the infraction. The regional manager also stated he had never witnessed bodies being placed on the floor, but stated that during the peak of COVID-19 when the refrigeration units were near capacity, the staff did place deceased bodies in an alternative tray and placed the tray on a casket dolly. The regional manager did say he could understand how someone might have misconstrued that as placing bodies on the floor. Regional manager also stated that TOSHA had been contacted and following their inspection. The regional manager stated that there were no findings by TOSHA concerning the allegations of complainant and their complaint to the funeral board. However, in legal's follow-up legal's follow communications with the investigator, the investigator stated that he observed on his first visit it did not appear that the bodies stored in the walk-in refrigeration unit were being handled in a respectful manner. Specifically, the investigator stated that when he arrived on March 1, 2022, that while there were no bodies stacked on top of each other, some bodies were not entirely covered. Additionally, the investigator added that it appeared the bodies had been hurriedly placed in the refrigeration unit with very little care. When the inspector returned to the facility on March 3, 2022, the bodies had been organized in a more respectful manner and were covered. The investigator attached photo comparisons to show the difference in how the bodies were placed from March 1st to March 3rd. Additionally, during legal's investigation, upon the inspector's arrival at the crematory during the first visit, the investigator met with an employee of respondent establishment. The employee stated that he would arrive each morning, he would wait for the funeral director to arrive on the premises, and maintained that the director would call when he arrived, and that the employee would proceed with work of cremating bodies and processing ashes. However, upon the investigator's arrival, the employee was in the process of removing a cremated body from the retort for processing despite the fact that no licensed funeral director was either on the premises or directly supervising the employee. Based on the above, though no evidence was found to corroborate complaints allegations due to the way in which the bodies were organized in March 1, 2022, inspection and the unlicensed activity from the crematory employee, we recommend a $1,500 civil penalty plus the cost of investigation authorized via consent order and formal hearing if necessary.
are there any maintenance logs or cleaning logs presented to back up some of their response? Um, my recollection, it was not presented by the respondent in their response, but that the investigator during his two inspections and during um, his conversation with kind of the routine annual inspections, um, that the maintenance issues seemed to it seemed as if there was a log and a record. Was the former employer employee fired, terminated, or leave on their own accord? I don't want to conflate from my recollection, the complainant was roommates with a former employee. I know for a fact, from my recollection and from what was presented from the respondents during the investigation, that that roommate, not the complainant, but the roommate of the complainant was terminated. Um, the complainant is no longer an employee there. I believe they were, again, not wanting to tell you the wrong information, but from my recollection, I believe she was an apprentice there and that her time there ran out. She was not terminated from my recollection, but the roommate of the complainant was. I may be understanding this, that it, at the end of the day on this complaint, it's not due to the, the cooler issues. It's to the fact that there was unlicensed in the crematory. That is correct. That it's, it's a culmination of the investigator's findings of the bodies on his first inspection on March 1st, not being placed in a respectful manner in addition to the uh, finding of unlicensed activity. The civil penalty comes from those two things as opposed to the direct um, allegations from the complainant. It just so happened during our investigation of this matter that these other two infractions were found. Was there a licensed funeral director on site? At the time, during his first inspection with him, when he met with the employee in the crematory, no, there was not. Is the crematory a standalone establishment license or is it part of the funeral home and attached? Meaning, um, if there's a funeral director that is attached to the establishment license, um, but not necessarily in the crematory, um, was there a licensed funeral director with that scenario? Um, again, I, there was not, um, what the investigator communicated to me was that the building behind that not only in the, uh, in the, well, on the entire premises. Okay, that makes a difference. The penalty laid before is in line with non licensees in the past that we've dealt with. That's correct. That being the case, I'll make the uh, motion. We accept legal's recommendation with the $1,500 civil penalty here. I have a motion by Mr. Harris to accept the recommendation. Is there a second? Second. I have a second by Ms. Haynes. All in favor? Aye. Complaints. Complaint number 208101. Complainant, a competitor of the respondent establishment, alleged unprofessional conduct on behalf of respondent. Specifically, complainants stated that they had worked with a particular family for hours on services and that all arrangements were completed. Complainant further stated that the family met with respondents to secure a grave space, opening and closing, and other burial services. However, complainants stated that there was a funeral home attached to the cemetery and that the funeral home offered them a free opening and closing in order to switch to their services. 
Complaint alleges that respondent's director called to inform them that the family would be switching to their services. Complaint stated that they had worked extensively with the family and they owed their basic service charge. Complaint alleges that respondent refused to pay for the charge and then used the same obituary that the complainant wrote, used the same casket, and emulated the other services that complainant was going to provide. Complainant stated that it was unfair that they had worked for free when respondent refused to pay them for their services that the family had already rendered and further alleged that respondent had solicited that family away from their business. Respondent denied or replied and denied the allegation that they had solicited the family away from complainant. Respondent claimed that during their, their meeting with the family, the family inquired about their offering of a free opening and closing when using their funeral home. The employee directed the family to a funeral director at the respondent establishment. The respondent stated that the family indicated that they were interested in a comparison of the services between complainant and respondent funeral home. Respondent reiterated that the funeral director only answered questions posed to him by the family and never solicited the free opening and closing. Respondent stated that the family later chose to meet with another funeral director of their own volition and then began to compare specifics of the contract with the complainant funeral home and the offerings of the respondent funeral home. Respondent attached to their response a letter from the, fam from the member of the family that corroborated respondent's versions of events, adding that they had used the same outline for the obituary that they had already helped put together for complainant's establishment. The family member stated that they were very appreciative of respondent services and corroborated, corroborated that they were not solicited by the respondent. Based on the above, legal would recommend closure. How would the family know that there was a free opening and closing if the other funeral home didn't tell them? Well, I can't say that for certain. My understanding is that there may have been just, I, I suppose, while well, searching around may have that as I agree based on what was said in the responses it appeared that the family knew of it going in when asking um, uh, I'm not certain exactly how they had that information going into the meeting but um, at, at some point I suppose it had been communicated to them How does this fall in line in um, soliciting uh, the solicitation law? Um, is certainly a good question. Um, I, I comes up with that is it can be a fine line, but the big thing that tilted the information we had, in my view, is that a letter written from a member of that family who said specifically, I believe verbatim, we were not solicited. Um, kind of, I, I guess, if chose to move forward with anything I, outside of closure, it would kind of almost be in um, opposition to the evidence that had been presented for this, this complaint. Do you know the charges of what the other funeral home had um, that they wanted the family to pay. Um, that was, from my recollection, was not provided to legal. It would be if there was a family member who said we weren't, we weren't solicited because uh, if they were solicited, then they would need to pay the, the other funeral home the charges. Do we have record that the uh, competitor establishment was paid for what services they had rendered? Uh, nothing was provided to legal. At, um, I'm uncertain where that uh, issue lays now, if they were ever paid or not. Uh, evidence that was provided on that was a... Um, just essentially a letter from the family saying that we were not solicited and in the process of the their experience with the services of the complaint and their detailing of the services with uh, respondent.
would it be appropriate for us to table this and ask for you to find out from the competitor if their portion was satisfied and taken care of before we close this case? Absolutely. That's something that the Just to clarify, so I make sure I do obtain the right information, um, want to make sure from the competitor whether the services that they had already provided were um, set, were paid for. May, may I add to if it wasn't paid, how much were the charges? I guess we need to do a uh, motion. So I move that legal, um, that we table this, have legal go back and find out from the competitor if the services that they had rendered to this point uh, were taken care of. And then, Ms. Stevens, if I understand right, the amount of that, is that correct? It's still outstanding. That's outstanding. Okay. I have a motion by Harris. Table the further investigation. Second. Second by comment for scope of the investigation. What station? Correct. That's all that that the complaint was. There That's wasn't correct. any. There wasn't any request or any conversation in regards to payment correct yes i would say in complainants complaint they the line about services was one sentence in their complaint they seemed primarily frustrated with the alleged solicitation um, I, I would say it would be a fair characterization to say this the solicitation was Back to the recommendation, we have a, a motion and a second uh, for tabling for further investigation. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Next complaints are... President, for the record, please rule pass or fail. I assume it's a pass, but... It would be a pass three to one. Okay, thank you. Next complaints are complaints numbers 2022-009481 against the fun funeral establishment and 2022-009411 against the funeral director. Complainant, the daughter of the deceased filed a complaint against respondent establishment and respondent funeral director alleging unprofessional conduct. Specifically, complaint alleged the following. One. Complaint and their family were not notified that the deceased had been moved from the respondent funeral home to a different funeral home. Complaint stated that they were given a 10, or excuse me, 12 o'clock appointment time for February 18th for a private viewing at respondent funeral home. Complaint contends that they called several times and that the time of the viewing changed multiple times. At 437 the same day, complaint stated that they were informed that the deceased remains were no longer at the respondent funeral home without their notification or permission. Two, the deceased was, quote, unrecognizable and did not have the earrings or necklace that was given to respondent to be placed on the deceased. Three, respondent posted an obituary that incorrectly stated there was a scheduled visitation at the funeral home. Four, respondent had lost the accessories provided to them by a complainant. Five, respondent performed improper embalmment as the complainant described the deceased as laying in an unnatural position and was, quote, bloated, disfigured, unrecognizable, and twice her size. Six, respondent did not provide the casket that complainant and their family had chosen. Complainant stated that they were told on February 18th, 2022, that the deceased did not fit the casket picked out and thus were placed in a different casket. Seven, the burial was scheduled, rescheduled from Saturday to Tuesday due to the casket issues. Eight, likewise, there were no escorts for the procession due to the rescheduling of the burial. Nine, the burial was delayed by 30 minutes due to the vault arriving late to the cemetery. Respondent replied and stated the following. One, the deceased remains were properly embalmed by a licensed embalmer for the state of Tennessee. Two, respondent denied that the deceased was bloated, disfigured, and un unrecognizable, and twice her size. 
As offered proof of this, respondents stated that the dress that the family had provided was the correct size and fit the deceased. Three, respondents stated that the deceased remains weighed more than the esti than estimated by the family and that her hands were in a natural position for a person laying down. Four, that the family represented to respondent that the deceased weighed less than 325 pounds at least five or six separate times and therefore sold the smaller casket size to the complainant and their family. Five, communicated with the complainant and their family in advance that respondent would not fit in the original casket provided and that a larger casket would be required and that it would be quicker to meet at a different funeral home. Respondent contends that complainant and their family agreed to this. Six, the burial schedule for Saturday had to be rescheduled to Tuesday because the cemetery required two graves and the vault company couldn't do a larger size vault until Tuesday. And seven, respondent stated that no escort services were paid for for Tuesday. This case was sent for investigation. The investigator spoke first with complainant who stated that they had purchased an oversized casket after meeting with respondent. Complainant stated that respondent informed her and her family that they could come to respondent establishment anytime after 12 o'clock p.m. for a private viewing of the deceased. However, complainant stated that she called respondent at 1.09 p.m. and was told that the deceased was not ready for viewing. Complainant called again at 2.26 p.m. and the call was not answered. Complainant called again at 2.35 p.m. and was told that the deceased could be ready for viewing between 2.40 p.m. and 3 o'clock p.m. When complainant called at 3, complainant contends she was told that the deceased would not fit in the casket that had been selected, but that respondent had a larger casket the family could use instead. Complainant stated that they were upset at the situation because they had specifically selected the former casket due to the color, but because of time constraints, accepted the use of the new casket. Complainant stated that they were then informed that a larger vault would be needed would need to be ordered to accommodate the larger casket and that the vault could not be delivered until the following Tuesday on February 22nd, 2022. Complainant then stated that four and a half hours later, respondent called and informed complainant that the deceased was ready to be viewed, that the viewing would take place at another funeral home due to the fact that the new casket would not fit through the doors of the original funeral home. After arriving at the new casket, or excuse me, sorry, after arriving at the new funeral home at 505, she was told by the staff that the deceased was not ready to be viewed. Clayton called respondent three separate times, but respondent did not answer. Finally, after 30 minutes of waiting, the family was allowed to view the deceased. Complainant further stated that the deceased was unrecognizable, he was extremely swollen, and that the cosmetics that the complainant provided to be used on the deceased, such as fingernail polish or lipstick, was not applied to the deceased, and that the accessories provided to the respondent had not been returned to the family. Finally, complainant stated that she had paid for two escort services in the amount of $400, but that no escorts were at the cemetery. The investigator spoke next to the respondent, who stated that during the meeting with the family, he asked three or four times about the weight of the, de uh, the deceased since they had indicated that she was a larger lady. Respondent contended that complainant and their family represented each time she weighed less than 300 pounds. As a result, respondent recommended a 28-inch wide casket, which the complainant eventually selected. Respondent stated after embalmment, the body could not be placed in the 28-inch casket because the deceased was around 450 pounds. Respondent maintained that he immediately informed the family he would need an even larger oversized 36-inch casket. Though the family's original casket had been in lavender, Respondent communicated that the casket only came in white. Respondent stated that complainant and their family agreed to the new casket. Respondent stated that he also informed complainant that due to the larger casket, he would need to take the deceased to a different funeral home for the private family viewing, explaining that the 36-inch casket could not fit through the doors of the original funeral home. Respondent further stated due to the size of the deceased, her hands could not be placed in a folded position across her stomach, and that the complainant nor the family ever mentioned anything about the cosmetics of the deceased or anything about jewelry. Respondent continued that the service was rescheduled since the family had to purchase an additional grave space due to the oversized casket and to allow the cemetery additional time to prepare the grave. Further, the vault company could not deliver the 46-inch oversized metal vault until February 22, 2022. Respondent next stated that the family had paid for two escorts at $200 each that were used to bring the family from their residence on the day of the funeral service, February 19th, but that the family did not pay for any escorts on the day of the committal service, February 22nd. Finally, Respondent admitted that there were errors in the obituary, but when they were notified of the mistake, corrections were made immediately. Respondent contended that the additional charges for the oversized casket and vault totaled approximately $3,200 over what he had charged the family but stated that they had absorbed the cost and did not charge the family. Finally, the investigator spoke to the manager and assistant manager for the mortuary service who had made the removal and embalmed the deceased. 
though they did not recall the exact weight of the deceased after confirming with the forensic center while the investigator was president. They confirmed that the weight of the deceased was 571 pounds per the forensic center's records. Based on the above, we would recommend a $250 civil penalty plus half of the cost of investigations for both the funeral establishment and the funeral director, authorized via consent order and formal hearing if necessary. make a motion one question um, there's just so many elements to this one the jewelry items that were missing were they ever refound and placed with the decedent um Eagle never was able to confirm that. The investigator, it was odd in that um, I made that a point in the investigation to ask about that. And it was, it, it appeared from the report that it was kind of a, they, they seemed more concerned almost with the, all the issues that occurred uh, with the casket and delay. Um, not to minimize that issue, but um, so I suppose the short version of to your question would be that for certain odd that that wasn't a more focal point of the complaint there's there's a big difference between less than 300 pounds and 500 and something pounds was um was their loved one there at the funeral home when the casket selection was made or was Sounds like it may have still been at the medical examiner's office. That's correct. Body of the deceased office at the time. So the respondent, the funeral director, did not based on the was the, were the um, escort charges on the uh, statement of goods and. They were the what appeared to be the issue there is that um, respondent was saying that the complainant and their family had paid for escort services and had gotten them for the service that was conducted on the 19th of February, but they did not pay for escort escort services for um, the cemetery. At, in investigation, the Respondent made mention that, you know, if, if they had wanted that, that would have been an additional $400 total. What's an escort charge for something being at the funeral home and not moving? If it was, oh, so it wasn't an escort, it was a removal fee. Oh, okay. I'm not used to I'll second Mr. Rom's um, motion. I'm going to have a motion. Second by Ms. Steve. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Next complaint is complaint number 202201. Complainant mother of the deceased alleged unprofessional conduct against respondent establishment. Specifically, complainant alleged that respondent allowed her contact information to become available to a member of the staff whom she had had a protective order against, leading to harassing messages and stalking from the employee. Respondent stated that they had spoken with the employee regarding complainant's contact information and admonished them for the incident. Respondent further stated that they had corrected the matter and made changes on contacting the next of kin. This case was sent for investigation. The investigator spoke first to complainant, who stated that she had been in a relationship with an employee of respondent establishment from 2016 until 2021. 
Complainant stated she broke off the relationship after the employee began stalking her, peeping in her windows, and sending threatening voicemails. Complainant stated that she had visited a respondent establishment twice and informed the owner that the employee was stalking her. Complainant purported that the owner said he would talk to the employee about the problem. Complainant stated she filed an order of protection against the employee, provided a copy of the order to the investigator. Complainant contacted respondent establishment regarding removal service for her son. Soon after, another employee contacted Complainant stating that the employee, which Complainant had dated, had said that if he could do anything to assist Complainant to let him know. Complainant said this was very upsetting and ultimately resulted in her moving her son's service to her home state, away from the state of Tennessee. Complainant stated that after this, the employee she had previously dated began calling, texting, and stalking her again. Complainant maintained that the employee did not have her telephone information prior to her contacting respondent establishment about her son's death. The investigator spoke next to the owner of Respondent Establishment, who stated that he spoke to the complainant on February 17, 2022. Respondent stated that complainant was upset that someone had given out her phone number. The owner stated that he was not aware of the order of protection until complainant had come to the establishment on February 17. The owner stated that he had a meeting with both employees soon after and admonished them about the importance of not releasing any personal information on any family or family member they serviced. The owner also said that he informed both employees that if another incident like this occurred, they would be immediately terminated. The owner stated that although all funeral files were locked in the office, as part-time employees, both employees would have had access to the files. The owner admitted the event should not have happened and stated that after his discussion with both employees, was confident that it would not happen again. Based on the above, we would recommend a letter of warning. employee that we're referring here, are they a licensed funeral director? I believe that they were. I, I believe that our time employee was kind of why this complaint was filed against the establishment as opposed to the individual himself. Well, I was curious about that. With that being the case, I'll make the motion we accept legal's recommendation letter of warning. A motion for Mr. Harris. Recommendation. Second. Second. Second by Mr. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? number is 0220124411. This complaint was administratively opened following an email received from a member of the public regarding a printed document. The printed document appeared to be a postcard with the name of an unlicensed establishment and a phone number that invited the person in possession of the postcard to an informational seminar to discuss pre-planned cremation. Specifically, the postcard stated that during the seminar, they would discuss the benefits of pre-planning, locking in today's cremation prices, peace of mind, and plans available in all states. The other side of the postcard provided the name and locations of the restaurants where the seminar would be held in Shelby County, Tennessee. This case was sent for investigation and was not sent to respondent for response. The investigator sat in on the presentation at one of the listed times and location on the postcard. The presenter stated that the respondent establishment was based in Tampa, Florida, and provided cremations to persons that prearranged and paid for their cremation in advance. The presenter further stated that it, <clears throat> if a person had paid for cremation in advance at the time of their death, the family would call the number provided and a staff member who was located in Florida would contact a local funeral or cremation provider. The local funeral or cremation provider would then make the local removal and arrange the cremation. Upon completing the cremation, the local funeral home or cremation prov provider would ship the cremated remains to the family. The presenter also stated that respondent establishment would assist the family with all the necessary documents. Following the presentation, the investigator spoke to the presenter. The presenter admitted that although he did have a Tennessee insurance producer's license, he was not registered as a Tennessee pre-need sales agent or as a funeral director. The presenter stated that he was unsure if the respondent establishment had a Tennessee funeral license or a pre-need registration, pre seller registration. Uh, they do not have either license with the state of Tennessee. Based on the above, it appears that respondent establishment is operating as an unlicensed funeral establishment. And based upon that, we would recommend a $1,000 civil penalty plus one third of the cost of investigation, authorized via consent order and formal hearing if necessary.
So the presenter was a licensed insurance agent, is that correct? That is correct. The question of that, is there a reason why there's not a penalty against that individual for representing a non-licensed establishment? There has been. As well, just for trans uh, the, the recommendation are are for that reason, and that um, a companion complaint was also opened against this establishment on uh, as a pre-need complaint as well. So the investigation costs have been um, we have recommended they be distributed evenly among the three complaints. So earlier, there was a civil penalty for a an unlicensed funeral home, I mean, an unlicensed operator working the crematory, and it was $1,500. This civil penalty is $1,000. Can we not be consistent and do $1,500 for both? If that is something, if the board is interested in moving it up to $1,500, that would, legal would not have objections. But what I would add is that in addition to the unlicensed activity on that former complaint, there were also issues regarding um, the respectful nature, or I suppose lack thereof, in which the bodies were um, being stored on the inspector's original okay. visit. That's a, that's a good point. I just, I just would like to be consistent. Absolutely. for approval I have a motion by Ms. Stevens to accept recommendation is there a second so move second by Mr. Harris all in favor aye, aye. aye. any opposed the last three all stem from the same set of facts and circumstances it is a represent something that was originally presented to the board those complaint numbers are 2021 Zero two four nine nine one, two zero two one, zero two five zero one one, and two zero two one zero one two eight zero one. So, what was originally presented to the board was two of these are administrative complaints based on information provided to the board office, indicating that the respondent was indicted by a grand jury on charges that included two counts of theft of property and one count of burglary. Additionally, a complaint, a complaint was submitted by the respondent's ex-employer indicating the same. The complaint indicates that the respondent was an employee of the complainant's establishment until he was discharged based on the theft and burglary. Documentation provided shows that the city police investigation discovered the amount taken from the complainant's establishment was estimated to be approximately $80,000. Additionally, the city police investigation discovered an estimated $13,000 was taken from individuals and not turned over to the funeral home for payments made towards funerals. The recommendation made to the board that was approved was authori authorization for a formal hearing, authorization for suspension of funeral director and a Balmer's license for a period of 12 calendar months, beginning on the first day of the month following execution of the order, a civil penalty of $1,000, 10 hours of continuing education courses approved by the board, and to successfully pass the tenancy laws, rules, and regulations examination via consent order. And additionally, the consent order shall include the respondent cannot work, perform services, or be associated in any manner with a funeral establishment during the suspension period. Legal has been in contact with the clerk's office that are handling the proceedings of the respondent. Although the respondent has been arraigned and indicted, the criminal proceedings are still pending. The statutes are violated only upon a conviction of a felony or a crime of moral turpitude. Since the proceedings are still ongoing, no conviction has occurred. Therefore, we would recommend that we move these cases to litigation monitoring, monitoring to be represented to the board once the criminal proceedings have been resolved. Approve recommendation. I'll second. Second by Ms. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
Thank you, Mr. Bryant. Next item on the agenda is the executive director's report. Mr. Gribble. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Legislative update for today. We have <clears throat> reduced this down to what actually has passed the General Assembly. House Bill 2103, Senate Bill 2570. Uh, that was transmitted to the governor for action on April 27. I checked the General Assembly website this morning. It doesn't show where it's been assigned to public chapter, but most likely that will happen in the next few days. House Bill 2352 and Senate Bill 1934 uh, signed a public chapter 0705 with effective dates of March 18, 2022 and January 1, 2023. It will make an effective March 18th and then the remainder of the of the law goes into effect January 1, 2023. House Bill 2024 and Senate Bill 2048 is assigned public chapter 0685 with an effective date of March the 28th. So when this session adjourned recently, any bills that were there, they terminate because it'll be a, a new session, a totally new session next year. Um, the session during two year periods. So this concluded the 112th General Assembly. Uh, legislative proposals for 2023. Uh, you probably recall receiving an email from me on uh, April the 19th uh, saying that uh, Commissioner holds a regulatory boards meeting each month and that legislative proposals for 2023 must be submitted for consideration no later than this Friday, which is May 13. Uh, so that was sent to each. Harris responded with an ideal for a proposal that only licensed funeral directors be able to write pre need funerals in the state of Tennessee and said that that was the situation as it now exists in Virginia and North Carolina. Uh, his information has been communicated to the assistant commissioner for consideration. I didn't receive any other uh, responses, so if, with assuming that would be the only only one. And as we've said before, and even as Mr. P are new, to, uh, what happens is the boards can submit proposals. And then those are looked at by the assistant commissioner, deputy commissioner, and commissioner. And then they make a recommendation to the governor's office. So this it starts down here, and then it goes on it goes up through multiple reviews. But uh, of course, there are about 22, I think, regulatory boards. So sometimes there'll be a bill that's submitted that'll have a combination of two or three boards' proposals. And then sometimes, you know, anywhere during that process, uh, it can be decided not to move forward. And it, but if it does make it through the governor's uh, office and, and they and they incorporate it, then it's part of the governor's packet for his legislation that's presented next year for consideration. Licensee report: You have a report of licenses that were administratively approved by the executive director pursuant to board authority for the period of May five, for the period of March 5, 2022 through May 6, 2022. Also, closed establishment since the last board meeting. There are two establishments that are reported closing: Car and Erwin, or Car and Helwin, Car and Helm Funeral Home, 129 Foxhall Street in Hartsville and Edward Hatch Funeral Directors, 2623 Galton Pike in Nashville. The Disciplinary Action Report. This is a report of consent orders that have been administratively accepted and approved by the Executive Director pursuant to the Board Authority and as reported on the February 22 and March 2022 Regulatory Board Disciplinary Action Reports. So you have a list of those establishments and individuals were action was authorized with the board. They executed the consent order, paid the paid the civil penalty, and those have been administratively 
master complaint report as of May the 6th there were a total of 35 complaints 18 of those were regarding funeral director and our embalmers and 17 against establishments Mr. President, I'll be glad to answer any question, but that concludes my report. Questions for Mr. Gribble? Make a motion we accept the report as given. I have a motion by Mr. Harris. Second. Second by Mr. Perry. In favor? Aye. Uh -huh. Any opposed? My understanding we have no applicants, either individual or establishments, is that correct? Correct, Mr. President. Any new business? So move. A motion by Mr. Harris. Second. 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 Ah. Ah.